Have you ever been to a restaurant where it seemed like your waiter was applying for adoption to your family? <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you could join me tonight. I'll be relaying your menu selections to our kitchen team. If there's any way I can make your dining experience more pleasant, please let me know. May I tell you about the specials we prepared just for you tonight? Those of us who are somewhat cynical probably see this as designed to ensure a big tip. More likely, the waiter is trying to distance himself or herself from the role of servant. Many, if not most of us, don't like people to think of us as their servant. Even if we are enamored by Downton Abbey, there has to be something about that that rubs us the, long, the wrong way, that some will always be destined to serve others, while others are destined to be served. When I was growing up, there were a couple occasions when we would have a maid come to the house. In theory, this was designed to take some of the burden off my mother, who was recovering after a stay in the hospital. But the reality was that my mother would drive herself to exhaustion the day before the maid arrived, trying to make the house spotless. She would have been deeply embarrassed if anyone thought she really needed someone's help to keep the house clean. Moreover, my mother, like many of us, I suspect, just wasn't comfortable with having someone as a servant. Perhaps our hesitancy to be put in the role of a servant or to have someone else serve us can be traced to the founding of our country that was supposedly built on the idea that all men are created equal, or to the Civil War in our troubled history of race relations, or to the struggle in more recent years for women to gain equality. But whatever the reason, the idea of slavery and servants is difficult for us to relate to. That, in turn, can make it difficult for us to relate to today's gospel reading. In the time of Jesus, it is estimated that three-fourths of all people were enslaved at some point in their lives. Slavery was something that everyone took for granted and could relate to. This is not to say that they liked it or that it was something they approved of. They just assumed that it was a fact of life. But it is not a fact of our life. So what could Jesus be saying to us in this reading? It is helpful to put the reading into context. Just before the passage we heard today, Jesus warned his disciples that no matter how hard they tried, sin is inevitable. Sin is inevitable. With this in mind, Jesus then admonished them that they needed to be ready to forgive one another, even if it happens seven times a day. It is in response to this seemingly impossible requirement to show mercy without ceasing that the apostles ask Jesus to increase their faith. They are truthfully telling Jesus that they don't think it is possible for them to be that forgiving. And Jesus, in effect, agrees with them, acknowledging that the faith they currently possess isn't sufficient. He then goes on to use an analogy, the story about servants, that they would have understood quite well, even if it rubs us the wrong way. Jesus is telling his disciples that the ability to forgive one another is not simply a matter of faith. It is more about acknowledging that God is ultimately in charge, that every disciple is a servant of God, and that every servant of God has a duty to forgive. 
but perhaps we still have trouble thinking of ourselves as servants, even as servants of God. In our first reading, the prophet, prophet Habakkuk goes even further. His oracle is one of the earliest examples of man questioning the ways of God. He is calling God to account for the way God is running the world. Implicitly, Habakkuk is expecting God to be his servant. And explicitly, he is more than a little distressed that God is letting him down and not doing a good job. Toward the end of the passage we heard today, God is beginning his response to Habakkuk, reminding him of who is God and who is not. God reminds Habakkuk that he needs to have faith, that God knows what God is doing, and that Habakkuk needs to serve God rather than expect God to serve him. In our second reading from the letter to Timothy, we are reminded that God has given us a spirit of power and love and self-control. With these gifts, with the strength that comes from God, God has empowered us to live out the gospel, even when it is hard. From the earliest days of the church, the disciples thought of themselves as servants of God. And in later centuries, one of the titles that was given to the Pope was servant of the servants of God. In the church today, the first step on the way to canonization and sainthood is to be proclaimed a servant of God. Christians have always seen the title servant of God as a badge of honor. Being a servant of God meant that they had been chosen and blessed by God to fulfill the commands of the gospel. And they fulfilled their duty as servant of God by caring for and forgiving one another. This is how Jesus lived. And he asked his disciples, us, to do the same. Let us pray that we can serve God and one another with integrity and joy, always willing to forgive. If today you hear God's voice, harden not your heart.